Through the years, it has been an honor and a privilege to partner with Great Lakes Christian College in their effort to send workers out into the field. We have with us today Professor Sam Long, Professor of Old Testament and Ministry from Great Lakes Christian College, and somewhat of a podcast internet rock star, Dr. Sam Long. Um, it's full of so many great aspects. Uh, one of my favorite aspects is this uh, idea of the great reversal. Basically, it's, it's the story of the underdog, uh, the person, the competitor, who we think has no chance of winning. You know, we love a good underdog story, don't we? Uh, one, some of my favorite movies uh, contain this trope. Um, I think in the movie Mighty Ducks. Any Mighty Ducks fans out there? Zero. Fantastic. No one over there. Um, Mighty Ducks is uh, this uh, story about a peewee hockey team. It's made up a bunch of uh, outcasts, and they defeat the all-star Hawks. Or how about the movie Hoosiers? Any Hoosier fans? No, because it's Ohio, apparently. <laughs> Hoosiers, there's a story of this coach with the checkered past, and of course he uh, pairs up with the local drunk. And they train a small town high school basketball team to become the top contender for the state championship. Or how about Cool Runnings? There gotta be some Cool Running fans out there, am I right? Oh boy. Cool Runnings is the story of the, the bobsled team from, of all places, Jamaica. Um, they've never seen snow, and yet they compete against the German and the Swiss teams in the Olympics. You know, I can go on and on listing movies that had this concept of the underdog overcoming. But it's not just movies, is it? Um, how about the Olympic, the U.S. Olympic team, the U.S. Olympic hockey team from uh, 1980, often dubbed the Miracle on Ice. The Americans, basically a bunch of amateur hockey players, defeated the four-time defending gold medal championships, the champions, the Russians. They were these professionals with all this international experience. And though they were seemingly undermanned and overmatched, they pulled together to win that game, and then they went on to win the gold medal game in one of the greatest upsets ever seen in sports. And Al Michaels forever memorialized that moment with his commentary, do you believe in miracles? These stories, they draw us in as we cheer for the protagonists who seem like they have no chance of winning. But by sheer will, maybe some surprising twists often a little bit of luck, they overcome and they succeed. The parallels to the Esther story are striking. The Jews are these exiled people. They're far from their homeland, far from their culture and their heritage. They're a minor people group that basically just blend into the massive Persian Empire. They're nobodies. They have no power. They have no influence. They're basically just in survival mode. And worse, some people hated them. They sought to annihilate them. They were the ultimate underdogs. But this underdog story would not end with annihilation. A Jewish girl named Esther becomes queen. A Jewish doorkeeper gains the favor of the king by doing the right thing. And despite the efforts of the evil Haman to destroy their people, they band together. They convince the king to allow them to protect themselves. And Esther chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it sums up this amazing reversal. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came before the king. For Esther had told what he was to her. Then the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. 
And so Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. This scene is the pivotal point in the story where the greatest reversal in the book has taken place. Esther and Mordecai have switched places. Haman is dead. And his wealth and his position now belong to Esther and Mordecai. And by the end of this story, good triumphs. Evil is destroyed. All ends happily. It has all the makings of a Hallmark movie. You all familiar with Hallmark movies, I assume? More fans of that, apparently. Hallmark movies are basically the same plot rehashed over and over and over again in slightly different ways. You have the down-on-her-luck heroine in danger of losing it all. She teams up with her foil, usually a handsome antagonizer, in order to overcome whatever hurdles are in their path. Throw in a gazebo, a dog, maybe some snow, and you've got yourself a movie. You know, I almost envision the writers are sitting in front of this dartboard with all these different cards, and they're throwing and trying to hit different scenarios. And so they're sitting there, they throw some darts. Oh, oh we hit, uh, let's see, a bakery, uh, autumn, golden retriever, and Midwest. What can we do with that? Let's see, uh, a young woman from Missouri. She's returned home from law school in the big city to keep her decent, recently deceased mother's bakery going. But she has no experience. And now the mean chain store owner in town is threatening to ruin her business and shut her down. Meanwhile, her golden retriever has not adapted to life in the new city yet. Until she meets the mean chain store owner's son, who has a labradoodle. Through their interactions, she's inspired to have her bakery succeed The dogs become lifelong friends, and the two beautiful stars end up getting married, yes, under a gazebo. Everyone lives happily ever after. I haven't checked, but I'm guessing that what I just made up is probably close to an actual Hallmark movie that's out there. And while it seems nice and encouraging, here's what's wrong with that storyline. Besides being a little trite, it's unrealistic. It gives false hope. That sort of stuff just doesn't happen, at least not to me. And yet when I turn to Esther, I have to take pause. Because Esther, to be honest, is not too far removed from a Hallmark movie, is it? You have this bizarre circumstance where a queen is deposed and the new queen ends up being a woman who is basically a refugee. You have a clear antagonist, Haman, who is looking to destroy an entire people group. And just when you think that all is lost, somehow things turn around. Haman is exposed, and Esther and Mordecai are elevated. But we, the reader, we know that things change not because of luck, not because of fate, not because of karma, not even because of the sheer will of Esther and Mordecai, but because of the providence of God. You know, God is not even mentioned in this book. Jewish readers and Christian readers, despite that, they can't help but see God's hand all over this story. Despite no mention of God, his presence and his providence are inescapable. Queen Vashti's dethronement, Esther's enthronement, the king's insomnia, the reading of the passage concerning Mordecai in the royal annals, Haman's early arrival in the court just in time to honor Mordecai. You know, Esther, it either contains almost laughable coincidences or something else is at work. Something like God orchestrating and intervening in order to save his people. This story is intentionally framed with a a hidden causality just under the surface of human history. This is not just a series of coincidences, but is the salvation of God's people worked out by none other than the creator of the universe. By chapter 8, of the story, we assume that good triumphs 
and evil's destroyed, and all ends happily, just like a Hallmark movie. And if this were a Hallmark movie, the screen would fade to black and the credits would roll after chapter 8. After all, the happy ending seemingly has been achieved. The villain is dead. The king and the queen are reunited. The hero has been rewarded. Now they can live happily ever after. But life is not a movie. And the author of Esther recognizes this fact. You know, some things have not changed. The king's character, it's unchanged. He has not admitted wrongdoing or responsibility, though he's a terrible person. The Jews are still under the threat of the law of the Medes and the Persians because it cannot be unchanged. There's a precarious happy ending at best. Annihilation remains an actual threat. And while we may not be worried about losing our lives or our loved ones to a homicidal maniac, we all understand that life is not a Hallmark movie for most of us, is it? Even when we have these small victories, so many setbacks feel like they're just going to overwhelm us. It's hard to press on, isn't it? It's hard to see this great reversal. Maybe you get a new job that provides you with financial security, and uh, then a parent becomes ill, and now they need regular attention. Maybe you finally heal a relationship with a child or, or with a sibling, but then there's some other issue that comes along that keeps you up at night. Maybe you finally feel good about your spiritual health, about your faith, and then something happens that just sends you reeling. So we turn to God and we say, where are you? Where is the victory? Where is this reversal? When will you take care of the Hamans in my life? If you've ever felt that way, you're in good company. Heroes of faith throughout time have asked similar questions. They lived lives of faithfulness only to look around and say, This isn't what I expected, God. Hebrews 11 lists off these amazingly faithful people. People who are in the Bible stories that we assume experienced a great reversal. People that we look up to and we try to emulate. But notice how the writer ends in Hebrews 11, verse 39. Yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better, so they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. I mean, are you serious? Abraham, Moses, David, Samuel, they didn't receive what was promised? They didn't get a victory? They did not experience the result of their faith? No. They didn't. Because life is not a Hallmark movie. We're left with loose ends and difficult circumstances and unresolved issues. And happily ever afters are few and far between. We pray and we cry out to God to reveal himself and to show us that this life of holiness and this life of righteousness are all worth it. God seems silent. I remember having a conversation with my brother um, many years ago now. He was struggling with his faith, and he was wondering um, what God's will was for him, what God's will was in this world even. He didn't feel God's presence. He just felt empty. And I'll never forget his words. He said, you know, I read the Bible And I see God revealing himself in amazing ways. And I read that God showed himself to Moses in a burning bush and told him exactly what to do. Well, where's my burning bush? And I can imagine Esther and Mordecai and the rest of the Jews on the brink of destruction asking the same thing. Where's my burning bush? Where's my miraculous reversal? We may want the same thing. 
And while we may want a fire or a parted sea or a victory over Goliath, what if God, more often than not, works the great reversal through something far more subtle? What if our lives more closely mirror the story of Esther, where instead of a great miracle, God works through a Jewish refugee far away in a land who gets her people to defend herself? Or maybe God works through a wandering Jewish rabbi in the first century. Or maybe through a cross or through an upside-down kingdom where we wait to see its full power unleashed on this world, not to control, but to free and to bring about restoration and healing. You see, God has already enacted the great reversal. The kingdom of God has arrived, but we eagerly and we longingly await it coming in its fullness. As you read through the Gospel of Luke, it ensures us that the kingdom of God in its fullness will confound all of our expectations and will overturn all of our experiences. In fact, the kingdom of God in it, everything will be turned upside down. I mean, just think of the Beatitudes. Luke writes, blessed are you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are now hungry, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who are now weeping, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and denounce your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice and leave for joy in that day. Behold, your reward will be great in the kingdom. Poor and hungry and mourning and hated people, they are the ultimate underdogs. And yet they receive from Jesus a great consolation. One day things will be different. The great reversal assures us that the poor and the vulnerable and the marginalized, all those who count for nothing in this world, they count very much in the kingdom of God. And the future holds great promise for them because God cares for them But it is a now and a not yet kingdom. It is something we look forward to rather than fully experiencing yet. We get glimpses instead. We see Christians living faithfully despite a world that calls us foolish and sometimes hates us. We see flashes of the kingdom coming as love and grace extended in terrible circumstances. And in the midst of suffering, we can still celebrate. Though everything has not worked out like a Hallmark movie, we still serve a God who is bringing the final victory. You know, the last two chapters of Esther, they recount this inaugural celebration of the Jewish festival called Purim. In Esther 9, 17, the author records, in the 14th day of the month of Adar, after they protected themselves from destruction, they rested, and they made a day of feasting and gladness. This was the first celebration of Purim. Many scholars think it comes from the Akkadian word pur, which means lot. And of course, this is referring to Haman casting lots to decide which day is the day that the Jews would be purged. And what I love about Purim is that even in the name, it reflects this great reversal. They took a terrible act, and they used it to name their celebration. From then on, Purim is going to have a very special place in in the Jewish calendar. Listen to what verses 20 through 22 of chapter 9 of Esther say. Mordecai recorded these things, and he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, encouraging them so should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar, and also the 15th day of the same month, year by year, as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies, and as the month that they had been turned from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting, And gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. And so they have this day. Purim is this amazing festival for the Jews. And sometimes it can be compared to the Christian celebration of Mardi Gras. 
right? There's this huge focus on feasting and like hilarity. This is the Jews' time to cut loose and to celebrate. According to the Talmud, which is uh, the Jewish uh, interpretation and commentary on the Old Testament, they say that a person on Purim is required to drink so much that he cannot tell the difference between cursed Haman and blessed Mordecai. That's a lot of drinking, I think. You can imagine there's a lot of feasting in the home. They send gifts of food to each other, and charitable giving is emphasized. And part of their celebration, they read the whole story of Esther in its entirety, right? And as they do, it's customary for them to boo and to hiss every time the name of Haman is read. Right? So you're reading through the book of Esther, and every time Haman comes up, they're like, boo, the whole time. And the purpose, they say, is to blot out the name of Haman. But I think one of the greatest images of this great reversal can be found in a pastry. They call them hamantaschen. It's a German word. It means uh, Haman's pouches. Uh, And this image signifies the money that Haman offered the king for permission to kill all the Jews. In Hebrew, they often call them uh, ozne haman, which means uh, Haman's ears. And uh, this kind of refers to the cutting off of a criminal's ears before his execution. So regardless of what the name is, the idea is that they are eating Haman's ears or devouring Haman's pouches of money. I mean, stop and think about that for a second. They incorporate this terrible person, Haman, into their celebration by creating a cookie named after him. They turn someone wicked into something sweet and leave it to the Jews to turn almost annihilation into a celebration. But things are not completely restored and it's not completely resolved and yet they are choosing to celebrate year by year. They understand that though things have not worked out completely, we have faith in a God who has already won the victory. And so we live as though we've already won. We give, and we love, and we share, and we rejoice, even when we feel persecuted, run over, the butt of the joke, the loser, the underdog. We let our future reality shape our present circumstances. And we extend that victory to the rest of the world. One of my minister friends, uh, he told me this great story about this kind of living, about extending this victory. Um, He went with his high schoolers to a Christ and Youth Conference a few summers ago. And while he was there, he had the opportunity to interact with this one uh, young man. And this young man desperately needed a win in life. He'd been going through some major things. And outside of the youth group kids, he didn't have a lot of friends. It's safe to assume that in most settings, he's the social outcast. Well, on Tuesday night of the conference, um, they hosted a talent show. And kids got to uh, showcase what they did best for three minutes. And uh, my friend told me there was some amazing acts, like uh, Taylor Swift-esque singing and humor and poems. And and the talents of the kids was pretty incredible. And then there was this kid. He signed up to be part of the talent show. And my friend was kind of worried. Because again, you know, he thought the kid was being set up for failure. Because this kid's talent was the Rubik's Cube. Right? He was a master. And no one questioned that. He could compl- the fact that he could complete the thing was impressive enough, but he could do it with ease. For the talent show, however, he wanted to do it blindfolded. And so my friend asked him, he says, well, how are you going to know when the colors line up? He goes, I, I just memorized the pattern. Well, my friend was skeptical, and he didn't think that the, the boy could succeed, but he was adamant. Well, this young man was the second act and after the host twisted up the Rubik's Cube a few times, the boy sat off the side of the stage, he was studying it, he was sort of tapping it, looking at it, staring at it. And when three minutes were up, they put the blindfold over his eyes and he put his hands behind his back. 
The crowd's looking on with amazement. I mean, it could easily have been the most impressive act of the night. The audience watched in silence as uh, his hands tapped and he twisted. And the video camera zoomed in on his hands as he's working it. And time counted down. And he failed. The host gave him extra time and he, he still failed. Well, they tried to comfort him with their applause. But you just see the defeat in his body language as he walked off stage. After the talent contest was over, my, my uh, friend, uh, he walked back with the young man to the dorm, and he asked him, how you doing? And he said, not good. I feel like that was my one chance. I failed. You know, it was one of those moments in a kid's life where it could have been a huge confidence boost to someone who really needed it. That was Tuesday. Fast forward to Friday, and it's the last night of the conference. The director comes up on the stage at the beginning of the night, and he says, I feel like we need to set something right tonight. I feel like we're close to seeing something amazing, and we just missed it. Is the Rubik's Cube kid here? Of course he was. He says, do you have your Rubik's Cube with you? And of course he did. It didn't go anywhere without it. He said, well, come on up here. We want to give you a second chance. So the director, he interviewed the boy, and he asked, what do you need to make this happen? He just said, I just need complete silence. So the director and the audience, they obliged, and he started again, and it got really awkward. And the director asked the boy if he was close, and he wasn't. And it got really awkward on stage. And so the director transitioned to offering, and the boy just sat there studying the Rubik's Cube. After the offering, the director asked the boy if he needed more time, and he did. And so the boy just sat there in front of the drums, looking at this Rubik's Cube. He's trying to memorize the pattern so that he can do it blindfolded. Meanwhile, the show must go on, and so the director interviewed the main speaker. The main speaker does his thing while the boy just sits there. I mean, imagine this scene. The speaker's up there talking. He's just sitting by the drums looking at a Rubik's Cube. Well, then the moment of truth came. The boy stood up. He turned around and he put the blindfold over his eyes and he placed his hands behind his back. And the video camera zoomed in on his hands, holding the Rubik's Cube. It was on the big screen for everyone to see. You could have heard a pin drop. 900 people completely silent. Everyone pulling for this kid. He started twisting and turning. And he did it. In 40 seconds... The boy completed the Rubik's Cube blindfolded behind his back. The audience erupted, standing ovation, clapping, cheering, whistling, high fives. They all celebrated his success. They even gave him a slow clap, you know? Right? He got high fives all the way back to his seat. It was an amazing experience. But his life wasn't all of a sudden great. All of his problems weren't just removed. But everyone there that night caught a glimpse of the kingdom. And for that kid, it may have made the difference between going on and giving up. He was given a second chance, and he was redeemed. He was encouraged he succeeded. That's what the kingdom of God should look like. That's what it means to see the kingdom come. And that's how the church should live out the great reversal as we work with Christ to redeem those who desperately need second chances in life. And we do it through little acts of blessing and giving, of healing and loving. Maybe there's an area in your life where you feel like the underdog. Maybe you don't feel like God, like God is at work in that area at all. You can't see God. You wonder where your burning bush is. But know this. God is at work even when you can't see it. You don't need to despair. God has already enacted the great reversal in this world. And so while we wait, 
We live out the great reversal and we pass it on. We give Rubik's Cube kids second and third and fourth chances. We take consolation in the fact that though it seems like the Hamans of this world are winning, the reality is that they are part of a sinking ship. And we celebrate the victory because we have a God who works often in unexpected ways, but nonetheless who continues to work to redeem and to restore this world as we eagerly await the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. Will you pray with me? God, you are the great orchestrator who can bring amazing things out of seemingly nothing, who can bring good out of the worst of circumstances. God, I pray that everyone in this room experiences your great reversal, that they see lives that have been destroyed and wrecked by sin can be restored. God, we need only look to Christ on the cross who takes this horrible act of death and redeems it for us. Thank you for being a God who restores, who loves, who never gives up on us, who gives us multiple chances because you know we need them. God, I pray you open up our eyes to what you are doing in this world, that it may not be a burning bush, but it is work. And it is for our good. Through Christ, we pray all these things.